Okay. 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 I think it's um, we waited uh, a minute, so maybe this is now the right time to to start. <clears throat> okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the NITEP colloquium on this uh, Monday afternoon. And uh, this afternoon, we are very fortunate to have with us Professor Morten Hjort Jensen, and I'm. Apologize if I don't pronounce your surname 100%. Yeah, uh, Morten is, is a professor at Michigan State University and at the University of Oslo. And uh, I'm particularly happy to, to introduce him this morning because he's also a lecturer in our NITEP uh, summer school that is uh, ongoing at the moment. And his lectures will start uh, next week, <laughs> if, if I'm not. Uh, mistaken and and Morten mm -hmm. agreed kindly to 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 to, to introduce himself uh, to the, the the South African community by giving uh, a colloquium on on one of his fields of uh, uh, of expertise. So Morten, thank you uh, so much for for being with us uh, today. And um, I see your first slide is already on the screen. So if you would like uh, to start, you, you're most than welcome. Just my last uh, comment that uh, I always need to do every time, please make use of the Q&A facility to ask questions, and then uh, we will make uh, a plan to channel them to, uh, to Morten. Yeah, so Morten, please. Thank you very much. Hey, welcome everybody. This is a great pleasure. Even though we cannot see each other live, it's a truly a great pleasure to, uh, to meet you. And I hope you will find these words, which I'm going to present today, of some use. Uh, some of you are also going to meet me next week and the week thereafter in the school which uh, Francesco is organizing. And uh, uh, hopefully some of the topics which we see here are topics which will come up again next week. Uh, you could also, if you want to, you could use a chat on the way while we while I'm talking. So I have the I have the chat open. If that is okay with Francesco, yes. Or yes, yes if you yes, Francesco the, the prefer that people and the, and the Q and A, and I will keep an eye on it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So I'm I'm actually right now in Norway. So if you can see out of the window, we have roughly something like two meters of snow where I am. So the uh, I guess the, the weather conditions where most of you are now are slightly different. Uh, the um, topic uh, which we, uh, which I wanted to present to you, so you can actually find uh, the slides here. They are all uh, online. So if you're interested here, uh, you can go to this GitHub address and you can uh, download the slides if you want to. Uh, there's a lot of teaching material if you're interested. So the aim here is to give you a kind of a pedestrian approach. So I'm assuming that you guys are roughly at the level of master degree, PhD. So I'm going to try to keep this uh, at, uh, at a level where people who have taken a course in advanced quantum mechanics or in, uh, let's say, modern quantum mechanics uh, can follow uh, most of the material here. So the, um, you can find the talk, you will find Jupyter notebooks, you can run these, you can find slides and everything. And these slides are also this link here. And uh, I sent this link to Francesco so you can uh, uh, download things if you... Yeah, I'm gonna put the, that's a, that's, a good, that's a good question actually. So I'm gonna put the link here in the chat here. Let me just put it quickly in the chat here. So now you should be able to see it in the chat and then you have the slides here. So the, um, uh, if you then just scroll through here, you can find, if you want to use this material, uh, you will find uh, Jupyter Notebooks on uh, Monte Carlo uh, calculations. And since I'm going to use this kind of Monte Carlo calculations as a stepping stone for motivating how you could use machine learning algorithms for solving quantum mechanical many body problems. So the, uh, the first notebook here has a, uh, as a kind of general introduction to uh, variational Monte Carlo and Monte Carlo methods for solving quantum mechanical problems. And then the second notebook moves over to using so-called Boltzmann machines, which uh, I'm coming back to. Uh, there are courses which we've been teaching, so I, I do actually work with the nuclear money body problem. And I've also been using machine learning methods on nuclear experiment. 
And we had a school last year where actually many people from South Africa participated. So we had a group of experimentalists from, <laughs> from uh, the university in Cape Town, which attended that machine learning course. Uh, there's a, another two weeks extensive course with lots of teaching material if you're interested in using that. So feel free to use that material as you want. The, um, this, why uh, do we want to use uh, machine learning applied on quantum mechanical many body problems? Now, one thing is that if you look at many of the traditional methods, uh, in many of the traditional methods, what you have, uh, so let me just say one thing here. So in here, in the in these slides, there shouldn't be any any links in in this specific slide. Uh, there's a question about uh, some specific links, but if you click on the link up here, maybe I should paste it in again. Yeah, so the people paste it in again. So you should be able to see the link from that one. Yeah, good. So uh, in in uh, if you then you can access the slides, you can actually download all all the material here. So the uh, uh, the, one of the reasons why we want to uh, uh, try machine learning methods is that many of the traditional methods, which are based on a discretization of a continuous problem, so you have a set of partial differential equations for many particle system, is that most of the methods like a uh, diagonalization methods, or you can use Green's function methods, you quickly run into the problem with uh, uh, an increasing dimensionality because you make a truncation in a single particle basis, and then you use this to expand a many body basis. And there's a limit to how big a such a basis you can uh, uh, tackle numerically. And so fields like machine learning have emerged as a possible ways to circumvent some of the traditional problems which we have when we deal with many particle problems. And uh, if you add to this uh, quantum computing and the hot field of quantum machine learning, there's a lot of activity going on on trying to tackle these basically uh, increasing dimensionality problems which we face in uh, quantum many particle systems. But we also face that if you're thinking of a field like turbulence in classical mechanics, uh, if you want to describe turbulence properly and you're solving something like the Navier-Stokes equations, you quickly end up in having a very, very fine grid and that can easily exceed your computational capabilities. So when you look at uh, even a problem like turbulence or higher dimensional uh, partial differential equations, many researchers have actually tried to apply machine learning techniques. Now, for many of you, uh, since you have uh, two of the authors of this excellent textbook in uh, South Africa, I strongly recommend take a look at that one if you're interested in machine learning and the application to quantum mechanical problem. That's a very hot topic. The... Um, uh, the overview here, I want to give you a very quick introduction to machine learning. And then I'm going to uh, give you a very brief survey of uh, what has been done traditionally within the field of uh, Monte Carlo methods. So these are normally based on Markov chains, and these are what we call Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And then from that one, uh, I'm going to present to you how you can solve the same type of problems using Boltzmann machines and deep learning. So the textbook, let me just go back to that one. So if you click on this one, so every everything which is highlighted here is clickable. So if you click on the link here, uh, this book is, if you go into it, it's called Supervised Learning with Quantum Computers. And probably uh, if you're on an IP address from your university, you can download it for free. And the uh, I highly recommend it. <coughs> and it's actually written, it's co-authored by, by the main organizer of this meeting here. So probably Francesco can give you a spare copy or has a link to the textbook. I really recommend it. So Francesco, guys, Francesco did not pay me to make publicity for the book. I'm just saying that because it's a very good book. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, guys. So the, um, uh, we are going to look at different applications of machine learning here. And uh, uh, the thing, th this is a field which is moving extremely fast. And it's a field which is driven by people which are half my age. 
so people my daughter's age i mean people of your age and uh, the uh, it's a field if you look at textbooks back in 2013 14 much of the material is even outdated or there have been so many new developments but you have famous libraries like scikit learn tensorflow which was released by google in 2015 you have Py pytorch which is uh, uh, facebook's variant keras is an api to tensorflow and there's much much more and many of these libraries are fully open source you can access them uh, there are github sites with thousands of people which contribute to the development of this software so it's a it's a cool field there's a lot of things happening and then the question is can we use this in physics analysis in a proper way uh, there's also a lot of room for creativity uh, not all the algorithms can be given a rigorous mathematical justification uh, so there's a lot of room for experimenting and, and uh, trial and error. Uh, obviously, you need to have a good command of linear algebra, probability theory, statistical data analysis. So you actually need to know a lot from different fields, and that's what makes it fun. And then if you look at the job market or also the way science is going to move now, uh, I think that having some kind of familiarity with machine learning is almost a kind of prerequisite for some of the most exciting jobs and it's it's you almost have this kind of feeling that if you can spell machine learning correctly you get a job and if you add quantum computing to that yeah then you are there you are and there's a lot of interesting stuff going on as i said if you look at the fields and the, the people active in the fields i mean it's uh, people from year 20 to 40 years there are many many active people in that field so when we look at, so this slide is a little bit dense. I apologize for that. So the, uh, uh, the approach to machine learning, they often split in two categories. You deal with supervised learning, and then you have unsupervised learning. Supervised learning is the standard one where you often want to make a prediction and you want to fit a model and you want to find correlations in the data. So standard machine learning falls within what people in statistics call a frequentist approach. So you're looking at the frequency of your data you're less interested in a probability distribution function, which uh, is something which interests us physicists much more because we would like to be able to estimate the errors if we have a probability distribution. So traditional machine learning has often dealt with classification problems or you fitting a continuous function to some specific model. So the discussion of which kind of model fits best, that's actually a big open issue. And uh, there are good methods, there are bad methods. Sometimes you can actually get away with plain ordinary least squares, just linear regression. And uh, when you do classification, uh, you would often have two or more classes, yes and no, minus one, plus one. And the goal is to produce a model which uh, assigns inputs to some of these classes. In physics, uh, if you look at a uh, big laboratory like CERN, where many South African universities are part of these big collaborations. So CERN has a huge computer science division and uh, they have been one of the driving forces in the development of machine learning algorithms for classification of uh, uh, experimental events. So like when I do nuclear physics, one of the things we often want to do is to classify whether this was a one electron beta decay or whether we had two electrons coming out of a beta decay and we would like to classify whether this was a proton or whether it was a helium which came out, helium atom which came out, or some, and so on. So the, uh, the two standard approaches which you will find are then supervised and unsupervised. Supervised is normally expensive because you have to have somebody who labels the data. Whereas often what we want to do is to attack a problem with uh, terabytes or petabytes of data and try to let the machine find the uh, the patterns in the data so that we can make a classification of let's say an experimental event uh, so if you take a kind of perspective on the interface between machine learning and physics so you have uncertainty quantifications which uh, is has more been the realm of uh, bayesian statistics where you want to uh, derive a probability distribution so you can estimate the errors and you can look at causation so a leads to b but you may not say the converse that B leads to A. The um, uh, machine learning community comes from more the, the frequentist approach, which means that we are more interested in making a prediction and in uh, 
finding correlations in the data set. And there's a lot of movement now in merging the two because we physicists, we are often interested in the probability distributions. And then when we do physics, we want to have fast simulations. We are often dealing with multi-scale modeling, my field, nuclear physics. We want to use the same microscopic theory uh, to address neutron stars. And then also to be able to, this so a neutron star has a radius of 10 kilometer. And then uh, you would also like to describe the properties of an atomic nucleus, which is down to 10 to the minus 15 meters. So you have uh, from 10 to the fourth meters down to 10 to the minus 15. So you have 19 orders of magnitude in length scales. And uh, so multi-scale modeling is one of the, uh, uh, how to say, the big challenges, whether you're doing nuclear physics, you do material science, you do atomic physics, molecular physics, or if you're doing life science and you want to go below uh, the cell level in modeling uh, what happens with the DNA, for instance. So there's a, uh, uh, you could say now that the fast simulations and multi-scale modeling is something which really pertains to what we might call modern science. Uh, in nuclear physics, which is my field, uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, applications of machine learning in the last years. It's still lagging behind particle physics, which has been the driving force, because when they planned the LHC, the uh, uh, one had to plan uh, how to deal with uh, petabytes or even exabytes of data. But clearly then it's impossible for us humans just to sit there and go through every single uh, possible events. That would just take the age of the universe with uh, millions of humans doing the same thing, which would be totally meaningless. So reconstruction of particle traje trajectories in, in experiments has been very much used. Design of detectors, uh, in lattice QCD, people have actually used machine learning methods. The, uh, an important application of uh, these methods is to improve the estimation of bias, uncertainty, due to introduction of, of or lack of physical constraints. Uh, we expect to use these kind of methods to improve our knowledge about correlations of physical models. And deep learning methods like Boltzmann machines and various recurrent neural networks, they have actually shown promise in, in uh, reducing the exploding dimensionalities which you encounter in quantum mechanical money body uh, calculations. Now, one thing, if you're interested in this link between machine learning and quantum computing, uh, there is a talk, there's a video by Sofia Vallecorsa, who's been uh, central at CERN in developing the machine learning project, but also in now in trying to merge machine learning with quantum computing. So in addition to uh, Francesco's book, I mean, I highly recommend to take a look at the uh, Sofia Vallecorsa's uh, talk, which you can find if you click on this link. So it's on YouTube and you can see the, uh, the talk there. Then I've also added lots of references, uh, the reference from nuclear physics, but also from other uh, fields. Uh, there's actually a scientific article, which I highly recommend. And this is this uh, article by Pankai Mehta, who's an experimental particle physicist, who's also turned into life science. Uh, this article is just excellent. So if you want a kind of bird's view and see the overarching uh, basics of machine learning methods applied to physics, I highly recommend the article by Pankai Mehta. The, uh, the article contains, for every example where they present results, contains Jupyter Notebooks. So you can actually download the Jupyter Notebooks and run them yourself. And that's pretty, that's pretty neat. And then uh, the, the um, calculations which I've used, they're actually much based on, on Giuseppe Carleo's uh, approach with Boltzmann machines. And there is a recent article there as well. So you can look up these references when, by just clicking on the links from the slides here. The um, basic ingredients when we do machine learning, and uh, you will see this being repeated when we look at Monte Carlo methods. So the basic recipe is you have a data set and that could be an observable quantity or the inputs to a wave function and the outputs from a wave function. And then you make a model and that model has a set of parameters. If you're doing neural network, that would be the weights and the biases of a neural network. And you want to uh, find the optimal parameters, which based on that model, minimize some function. So in uh, machine learning, there's something which is called the loss, cost, or risk function. 
And that one uh, allows you uh, to evaluate whether your model is a good one or bad one. So you have the data set, you want to do something with that, you want to classify some experiments, or you want to uh, recognize some images, or you want to uh, fit a function. And that is your model here. So that comes in there. And then finally, you, have a, you need to assess uh, whether this is a good or bad model. And then at the heart of everything, at the heart of every machine learning uh, approach, there is a minimization or what you might call an optimization problem. So the optimization problem, that's really where the hard labor takes place. So that means convex optimization algorithms. If you're familiar with gradient descent, the whole family of these methods, that's where these actually kick in. And that's these are the working horses of basically all the machine learning algorithms. And if you can improve one of these methods to get better uh, optimizations of uh, multi-dimensional functions, you're going to get many friends, many new friends. I promise that you will be very popular. So that's really at the at the heart of many of the machine learning algorithms. Okay, so uh, the kind of networks which um, we are dealing with, both when we do Boltzmann machines and neural networks, actually called uh, uh, this, this one of the standard ones is a so-called feed forward. So you have some inputs, you feed them forward through hidden layers. They're called hidden layers because we never look at the outputs from these. And then you have an output layer. So in this case, this would output something like just one variable. So it could be you making a prediction whether uh, my internet will be stable or not during this seminar, which could happen. So you could have an output minus or plus one, stable, not stable. So the, um, uh, the inputs here would be some data sets which you have, and then you have some output. It could be one uh, output, or it could be many. And then you have hidden layers, which then allows you to fit uh, functions which are beyond linear functions. So a neural network can actually be shown. There's something called the general approximation theorem. And the, the, uh, the general approximation theorem simply states that you can uh, fit uh, any nonlinear function with just one hidden layer. So that's something which is very much used here. So I'm, I'm going to skip some of these things because I have some data on experiments. Uh, I wanted to actually, because I, I don't want to, uh, I want to actually get to the, to the theoretical calculations here. So I'm going to skip the analysis of experiments. And uh, we are going to look at how we can solve a, a quantum mechanical many particle problem. And in this case, it's just two electrons. Uh, this is a system of two electrons in a two-dimensional trap. It's called a quantum dot. And quantum dots are very hot candidates for actually making quantum gates. So people do actually make these now in the lab. So you can now think of electrons being confined uh, to move in harmonic oscillator-like potentials. And you can make these in the lab very easily. And the, uh, the systems are normally also pretty stable. Now, for us, this serves as an academic problem. So we would have a, a two electrons which interact with a Coulomb force, which is given here. And then you can transform this to a relative motion because that's the relevant degrees of freedom. So this Rij becomes just R here. So you would have an harmonic oscillator potential. These are the relative coordinates. And this can be solved analytically. So there's a paper back from the 90s by uh, Tout. Uh, which provides analytical solution. This is one of the few many particle problems which can be solved analytically. So, and so that provides a, a, an extremely useful benchmark for your calculations. So this is a system which we're going to look at. First two electrons, and then we're going to put more electrons. And the thing which I wanted to, to say something about is also the, um, the, um, Monte, the basic uh, quantum Monte Carlo approach. And um, in the basic quantum Monte Carlo approach, uh, what we essentially end up doing is that we have a trial wave function. So we don't know the exact function, then we plug in a model. And then we want simply to optimize this integral as a function of uh, variational parameters. And we use the variational theorem, which then states that the expected value which we calculate is, unless we have the exact function, it's never gonna be in equal to the exact energy we are looking for, for this specific system with that specific Hamiltonian. So the uh, variational Monte Carlo calculation 
or quantum Monte Carlo in its simplest form, is nothing but an optimization problem of a multidimensional integral. So that's the mathematical uh, way of looking at a Monte Carlo uh, calculation. And then you have to plug in a uh, function here, which is the trial weight function. So this t, if it's the exact one, the problem is solved. If not, you have to evaluate this integral. So the way this is done is that you have a trial wave function, which now depends on some parameters, alpha. When you move on to neural networks, Boltzmann machines or standard neural networks, these become the weights and the biases in a neural networks. And you want to find the parameters which minimize the function which you see here. So a variation of Monte Carlo calculations assumes that you can define a probability and that's given by the standard quantum mechanical probability, where you have an energy denominator, with, no, and a denominator which is now the uh, norm of the wave function. And when you do uh, Markov chains with the Metropolis algorithm, you get rid of that one because you take ratios between probabilities. So you want to evaluate this one, but then since that one does not look like a quantum mechanical, um, no, a general expectation value with a probability, you introduce a new quantity. And then you can rewrite the integral like a probability times a quantity EL, which is the local energy. And when you do the Monte Carlo calculations, you just invoke the law of large numbers. And what you're simply doing then is to sample over as many such positions as possible or configurations as we often call them. And then your expected energy is now just the sum over all the samples you're doing. So you have a chain of random walkers jumping around in space. You collect these positions, you evaluate uh, this object here, you have your probability, and then you keep going till you have done this millions and billions of times. And hopefully then you're approaching the true expected value. This is the basics of a variation of Monte Carlo calculation. And in those Jupyter notebooks, which I linked to you guys, uh, you can actually find more lectures about this and also programs which you can run and perform your own variation of Monte Carlo calculation for this specific system. Now, the, um, uh, one of the things uh, which is particular to a, a variation of Monte Carlo calculation, and this is where all the evil is rooted. So it's actually to find a trial wave function, which is meaningful. So you can always define any type of function here. This psi of t is your trial function, is a function of, uh, of some parameters, alpha, the variational parameters, which you use to minimize this function, which is now a multidimensional function. So if you have 10 parameters, this is a 10 dimensional problem you want to optimize. And then the, uh, the way you would do it now for harmonic oscillators that you would say that, okay, if my interaction is weak, I could now assume that it contains the two single particles moving in a harmonic oscillator potential. And then I have this, this beast here, which is actually a so -called, the so-called correlation part or Jastrow factor. And uh, uh, this is where we bake in some minimal physics requirements. So what we are gonna do later is that we're going to replace this piece, which you see here with a uh, neural network. And then we're going to let the neural network find the optimal uh, correlated part of the wave function. So we're gonna assume that the one electron piece or the one particle piece is meaningful. So we have an acceptable mean field, which uh, meets some of the physics requirements. And then we let the neural network explore all the possible parameters to set up the correlated part of the wave function. So normally when we do this, uh, and, uh, we do it analytically. And if you come from a field like mine in nuclear physics, this uh, correlated part, which you see here is much, much more complicated. And if I add free body forces, I would just have to go down in my basement, cry for some days, and then start to calculate these uh, terms and then come back and hopefully I've done the calculations correctly. Oh yeah, no, so the, uh, uh, there's a lot of interest. Uh, so DF, D, DFT, I assume you're, you're meaning that. So uh, DFT uh, is actually a uh, effective uh, mean field calculation where you're finding an uh, effective mean field by solving coupled uh, single particle equations. So if I were to uh, take away this correlation piece and I could replace the uh, particle, the uh, single, the, the wave function with a product of single particle wave function from a DFT calculation. 
If I then calculate the energy, I should get exactly the same energy as I have with a DFT calculation for a money particle system. But the DFT calculation, if you want to deal with correlations, then it becomes much more complicated to introduce correlations in a systematic way. So this is a way to include correlations. And this is a kind of minimal requirement, which then comes from you looking at the wave function. So this is the radial wave function in the relative and central mass frame. So this is in relative coordinates, where I'm looking at the distance between two particles, r, i, and j. I call them one, two here. So this i and j uh, are now supposed to be particles one and two, since I'm looking at a two particle problem. And then what happens then is that in order for the divergence you have here, so you have a divergence when r, the relative distance goes to zero from the kinetic energy, and you have a divergence from the potential energy. And then you require, because all the other terms will be finite, when this our relative distance goes to zero, they will all be finite due to the quantum mechanical definitions of the derivatives. And then we need to fulfill this equation here when R12 goes to zero. So these two divergences have to cancel each other. And then you have a minimal form of the wave function, which is this one. So that's uh, something you would bake in when you now are modeling the correlated part of the wave function. But we are going to let a neural network define that one. So we will take the best insight we have from a DFT calculation or Hartree-Fock calculation and use that single particle basis. And then we will let the neural network figure out the correlated part of the wave function. So that's the kind of overarching philosophy here. Now, the thing which uh, is important for us now is that what we end up with is an optimization problem. And this optimization problem, which we have, is that we want to take the derivatives of this object as a function of these parameters alpha, and we want to put that to zero. So I just in introduced a shorthand here. So this E bar on top is actually the derivative of the expectation value of the energy with respect to the parameters. In our case, these are the variational parameters. And I need another quantity, which is now also the derivative of the wave function with respect to these parameters. And then if you use the uh, quantum mechanical uh, properties of the Hamiltonian, like hemeticity, and you use the chain rule, you can actually show that you can now uh, calculate the derivative of the energy. And this becomes now the function you want to minimize. So the cost function is the, if we now want to link with the machine learning language, the cost function is your expectation value of the energy. And that's the quantity you want to minimize. And then you have to take the derivatives here of a, a multidimensional object, which now depends on the different alphas, the parameters. When you go to a neural network, the parameters are going to be the weights and the biases of a neural network. So that's the, essentially it's the same equation which you will see popping up again when you deal with Boltzmann machines. The only problem now is that you, since these are multidimensional integrals, uh, this is actually where you're going to spend a lot of CPU cycles. So anything which can improve the calculation of these derivatives is highly welcome. So that's a uh, very important topic. Now, one thing you could do now, you don't need to deal with the, um, uh, to the, uh, with the energy. So we have a, like here we have a model, that's the likelihood function. And then we have defined this cost function or loss or risk function as called in the machine learning language in terms of the energy of the system as a function of these variables. And then we could take the derivatives, but we could actually use the variance because we don't know the, the energy, but we know that if the variance uh, is, if you have the correct wave function, then the variance is exactly equal to zero. Or since I come from Norway, it is the amount of points which Norway gets when they try to qualify for the World Cup in soccer every time. So they always end up last and they have zero points. So the, um, uh, so the um, one that you could do now is instead of using the energy, you could make these variations on the variance. But the, the reason why many people don't do that is that the variance leads to a much more complicated equation. So you have many more integrals to derive. So this is something which is called the Hessian matrix. And uh, this Hessian matrix uh, is 
is something which is much more time consuming and you have more integrals to evaluate. So normally people just vary the energy. Uh, the, the variance uh, is a function to which you know that it has to be exactly equal to zero if you have the correct result, because then your wave function uh, is an eigenfunction of the given Hamiltonian. And then when you calculate the variance of the system, that's exactly equal to zero. So that would be another way of doing that, but it's uh, less done because it, uh, to evaluate these integrals, you would evaluate them as stochastic integrals with Monte Carlo methods, and they are multidimensional integrals, and that becomes uh, prone to errors, and it becomes time consuming as well. So there's always a kind of balance which you guys have to strike when you want to run such calculations. Okay, so why Boltzmann machines? So this is a way to uh, uh, circumvent this problem with setting up the, uh, uh, the correlated part. So now we are going to let a neural network calculate the correlated part for us. So Boltzmann machines actually got a lot of attention in the beginning of the last decade. Uh, and the, uh, the reason for that was there was a lot of uh, interest in classifications problems and imaging. So Boltzmann machines are actually similar to uh, standard neural networks. So you can stack them, but normally they just come with one hidden layer and compared to a normal neural network where the input remains fixed. So you have an input and you have an output now with a Boltzmann machine, you keep changing the input. Uh, so in the optimization problem, the input gets changed continuously. And uh, what you would also do is to use a, um, a Boltzmann distribution in order to set up the quantity you want to optimize. So it normally has uh, a visible units and a set of unknown hidden units. Uh, you could couple the uh, hidden nodes and the visible nodes, but normally the coupling with the weights is only done between hidden nodes and the uh, visible nodes. Uh, you can have bias. You can use uh, the nice thing with Boltzmann machines as they're very flexible. Uh, you can play around with different types of shapes and try different uh, probabilities if you want to do. So the typical figure would be something like this. You would have a visible layer. Uh, you would have some function A of I. This would be the outputs from the visible layer. There will be the weights. These are the unknown quantities. And then you would have some, so these AIs and B mu here, these are so-called biases. And uh, they are quantities which are normally set different to zero in case your weights become accidentally zero so that the training will stop. But the typical network is looks a little bit different from a neural network. So there's a continuous feedback. So your input keeps changing in the optimization process. So let me just show you a typical, the, the typical function which you would have. So the uh, restricted Boltzmann machine as it's normally called, so it has a one layer and it has uh, only connections between the nodes in the visible and the hidden layer. So it contains a function which now has all the parameters. So this is the probability distribution which you have and it looks like a Boltzmann distribution. So this, uh, we are going to come back to this E, what it looks like. Uh, T, which plays the role of temperature is normally set to one when you're doing this quantum mechanical calculations. And then you have an integral over the visible layers and the hidden layers. So the hidden layers introduce a set of new parameters. So you can think of this as new variational parameters. So it increases your parameter space. So a standard variational Monte Carlo and diffusion Monte Carlo calculation, they have something like 10 to 20 parameters. But here, depending on the number of visible and hidden nodes, you can have uh, thousands of parameters to optimize. So the optimization problem becomes much more difficult than the standard one, which you would have in a variational Monte Carlo calculation or diffusion Monte Carlo calculation. So a typical Boltzmann machine is now, if you have a binary binary machine, so you would now have binary outputs. So you could take values like zero and one. So that would be an example of a typical Boltzmann machine. Uh, it's not given by the Hamiltonian. I'm coming back to where the Hamiltonian comes in. But the one which is used more is now to have a uh, continuous output. The XIs are now seen as the input variables for your wave function. And you're going to replace the probability for the wave function with the Boltzmann probability. And uh, you would like to have continuous variables. So you have a Gaussian now. So this is actually derived from a Gaussian. 
And then you have the connections between the hidden layers and the, the uh, visible layer. Uh, normally you don't have the variance, so you would typically put that to one. And then you have a bias which acts on the hidden layers. So it looks very much like a standard neural network, except that now we allow these to take continuous values here. And then what you're going to do next is to uh, set up this Boltzmann distribution and you're going to replace your wave function. And this was done by Troyer and Carleo back in 2017, there's a, there's a science paper. So what they call this is a neural network quantum state. So then let now the trial wave function be replaced by a neuron, by this Boltzmann machine. So if I sum up over the H's here, the hidden layers, then I get my so-called uh, marginal distribution, which now contains only X as a variable. And then I have these parameters, which now need to be optimized by my uh, neural network algorithm for optimization. So I would have these parameters A of I, BJ, and the WIJ, which are now parameters in the theory. So these are the, uh, I have many more parameters to optimize. And this was essentially what they did. Now, what we have done then uh, is to, uh, if you look at this function here, you can uh, make it more complicated by adding your physics insights. So one of the things we did was actually to add the solution of a one particle problem and then take them uh, for fermions, we would have a Slater determinant, which could arise from a DFT calculation. And that would give you the anti-symmetry of the wave function, which normally is more difficult to obtain from a new neural network. So you could think of now taking this object here and multiply that one with a uh, Slater determinant if you're doing fermions. And then the cost function, which you have, uh, is basically the same. It's the expectation value of the energy. But now when you're calculating the gradients and you want to minimize the parameters, so this theta contains now the weights and the biases of a neural network. And essentially what I end up doing now is more or less the same equation I had when I did the variation Monte Carlo calculation, except that my wave function now is changed by a Boltzmann, with a Boltzmann machine, which could also be multiplied with a standard Slater determinant. Uh, you can find, uh, the source code for running the calculations in the two particle case, I actually have examples here. If you're interested in running some of these calculations yourself, there is a source code for doing that in C++, but also in the Jupyter notebooks in the beginning, you will find the source codes for doing dealing with a two electron case in Python, if you're interested in using those. So you could play around with these codes if you wish to. So what we did here, I'll just give you some results. Uh, what you see now, uh, uh, this is the uh, calculation which is done uh, with a, uh, so you have the exact energy for this two electron case with a frequency oscillator frequency of one. Then uh, the exact result should be free. And uh, this calculation here is actually the calculation which we run. It's not a variational Monte Carlo calculation, but it's actually a Boltzmann machine calculation. And the Hartree-Fock calculation uh, gives you a result which is uh, slightly above the exact value. Whereas when you use these Boltzmann machines, you're actually getting bang on the exact result. Uh, you can see this more uh, with two different types of calculations here. So this calculation here, uh, you see the exact result. This is a standard variation of Monte Carlo calculation. And this is now with the Boltzmann machine, but where we have actually multiplied with the harmonic oscillator single particle wave functions. And you see that both results converge rather quickly after some number of iterations to the exact result. Uh, you can calculate the uh, uh, one body densities, which tells you the distribution of an electron in this. Uh, so this is for the, the case of uh, six electrons. So this is a six particle case. So it was six was hidden up here. And in this specific case, what we have is a variation of Monte Carlo calculation, which is the blue one. This RBM now is just a plain Boltzmann machine without any knowledge on the uh, quantum mechanical system you are looking at. So there's no guidance. It's just a plain uh, Boltzmann machine. And for this specific case, we're getting pretty close. The RBM plus S stands with a Slater determinant times a Jastrow factor, which we have included here, a standard Boltzmann machine. So we have more parameters. And that is also getting a little bit closer to the standard uh, variational Monte Carlo calculation. This is a case of weakly interacting uh, of where the interaction doesn't play a large role. 
But if we now have a more interacting case, so the frequency is lowered, the, um, what you get then is that you this Boltzmann machine, which essentially has no physics information here. And actually it doesn't obey the right anti-symmetry either. This one does a pretty bad job. But if I now add a Slater determinant to this uh, and a Jastro factor, plus the Boltzmann machine, I'm getting pretty close. I have a simpler Jastro factor here. I'm getting pretty close to the exact wave function. To the, ex, to not, not the exact function, but the results with a variation of Monte Carlo calculation. And you can repeat the same with the 30 electrons in this case. So this is a money body calculation with, uh, it's a principle of variational calculation, variational Monte Carlo calculation except that one, the VMC takes a standard Monte Carlo approach. And here I have two parameters. And here I let the Boltzmann machine now decide the, uh, the uh, correlated part of the wave function. Now, one thing which has, I'm gonna skip this one, but one thing which has been done also, instead of using Boltzmann machines, is to use uh, neural networks. So in nuclear physics, there's a recent paper by um, Adams et al. And you can click on this link. There's also a paper by Cable and Rios where they looked at the uh, solution of the Deutron. And uh, Adams et al, what they did was do a, perform a variation of Monte Carlo calculation uh, where what they did, uh, so this is the uh, Hamiltonian which you have. So it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details, but what they did then was to replace this correlation piece, which you see here, with a, a neural network. And then they repeated the calculations here. So depending on the type of forces, so these are the uh, convergent results, which they have depending on the some parameters of the potential. And they basically converge. So this is for the two new nucleon case. So you should get the binding energy of the deuteron of minus 2.223. And uh, the neural network is actually able to reproduce after a given number of iterations although you have many more variational parameters than you did in the standard variation of Monte Carlo calculation. So it cannot yet compete with a standard variation of Monte Carlo calculation, which is fine tuned to this specific problem, but still it's capable of reproducing the same results. And that's very promising. And they also did this for up to four uh, nucleons. So what I would say when we now, um, I want to wrap up a little bit. So you will find uh, lots of experimental analysis coming in many fields. So in nuclear physics, in particular, in particle physics, in many, many uh, domains of physics, there are still many low hanging fruits because people haven't, have just yet started to, to apply machine learning methods. Uh, what I've showed you, and you have the codes and everything is an extension of this work by Troy and Kaleo. They actually looked at the system uh, of the spins, a quantum mechanical easing model. Whereas here we're just taking a standard Monte Carlo approach with a, a, a standard trial wave function, which we replace with either a neural network or a Boltzmann machine. And they're pretty promising results with these neural networks. I think this is more promising than what we did with the Boltzmann machines. Uh, they're much more flexible. So you can start with a very good guess, like uh, a Slater determinant with the right anti-symmetry with uh, an optimized single particle basis by D DFT calculations. And then you would let a neural network try to find uh, the optimal correlated part. Uh, the anti-symmetry is normally dealt with uh, multiplying the trial wave function with a Slater determinant. So that's where your Hartree-Fock calculation or DFT calculation comes in. So we have used a standard Hartree-Fock theory to find the optimal Slater determinant. And then we have used uh, machine learning to determine the correlated part. So the question is now, can we use it to find out which correlations are relevant and thereby diminish the dimensionality problem in something like uh, renormalization theories, copper cluster theory, which is a favorite money body method. So the kind of overarching questions beside the technical calculations is, can we use this to extract some deeper insights about the money body system? This is what we want at the end we want to be able to get some deeper information about correlation. So remember again that machine learning is about the standard frequentist approach is about finding correlations and making predictions. And the, one of the things we want to understand is whether this gives us some deeper information about correlations in the money body system. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. 
the optimization problem is obviously, as I say here, that's one of the places where we waste a lot of cycles. So anything which improves that is very, very welcome. If we now look back again here, so as I said, this work is very much inspired by what Kaleo did. And I also recommend you to look at the paper by, by Adams and company. And here's a list of uh, good friends and colleagues whom have given me many, many insights. So there's a good question in the chat here. With many fermions, do you have to renormalize the energy divergences explicitly or do the RBMs do them automatically? That's a very good question because when you plugged in that specific form of the wave function with the Jastro factor, where you took into account the divergences, then you have that in a trial wave function. So the Boltzmann machine doesn't do that automatically for you. So if you go back to uh, the figures here, uh, like the figure which you see here, for instance, with Slater plus Jastrow. So this J here is a minimal Jastrow factor, which makes sure that you cancel the uh, divergences because the Boltzmann machine doesn't do that automatically for you. So you could view the Boltzmann machine as something which gives you an additional set of minimization parameters. And the same way you can look at the neural network. So what you're doing now is that you're applying to the um, in setting up a trial wave function which contains a neural network but then you multiply that with what you know the physics which you know so that's a very good question actually so you you can't escape uh, using i mean you should use the physics knowledge which you have good questions i'm actually done guys i went a little bit over time and i hope you can forgive me so the um Feel free to put questions in the chat or unmute yourself. Francesco is going to ask. Yeah, Morten, thank you very much for the excellent talk, for this fantastic introduction to <clears throat> machine learning uh, methods in the, in the physical sciences. And uh, uh, I also need to do a little advert just to counterbalance the adverts of Morten. Morten also, I think, is in the process of, of publishing a, a two volume book on computational physics that uh, uh, I checked while he was talking should come out with uh, IOP uh, probably in a couple of months. Yeah, so please keep an eye on that because uh, um, if it is as good as his talk, the book will be excellent. <laughs> By the way, can I say something, uh, Francesco? If, you, if, Please, you, if you go to my GitHub address, you find the textbooks. I mean, everything is in there. So you can, oh, okay. you can download everything because, I mean, my basic philosophy, and this actually goes back yeah. to because, Francesco, you told me your wife is from Mauritius. I once was actually, yes. I got an email from a student from Mauritius who, was, who came across this material and was using that for her uh, bachelor degree and was asking whether she could use that uh, okay. And the, the whole thing of putting everything online is that everybody can use it, and I think that's very. No, no. I think that's very important. That's fantastic, and I completely agree and share the open <laughs> access point of point of view and the open source point of view as well. No, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think there were uh, another couple of interesting questions that uh, I think we will try to address um, quickly because I know that. Do you have another commitment just uh, uh, around five? Uh, and sorry. Ah, and one was, uh, um, I think, more general comprehension question. Um, can you comment briefly on the application of machine learning, um, maybe in the more chemical, medicinal field? The, the thing is that there are, there's almost an unlimited type of applications. So, a, um, uh, so one thing which uh, I have colleagues in uh, material science and, and chemistry, uh, which are going through properties of materials in order to figure out which one uh, could make good candidates for, uh, for, 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 for setting up uh, qubits, just as an example, right? So you would then uh, uh, have a uh, set up a classification uh, problem based on the data set which you have and then uh, simply try to go through all the data sets and figure out whether there are candidates which would be uh, ideal for that. So the, the thing is that the, it's, it is, it is almost an kind of unlimited, if you have a classification problem, 
So if you, uh, so one of the classical one in, in medicine or life science would be to uh, uh, have data on uh, specific types of tumors, just to give an example, and then you would classify, you would have some specific features like uh, uh, the texture of the tumor, uh, the radius, the circumference, and so on. And some of these can be easily classified as uh, benign tumors, and some of them can be malignant. So a pathologist normally, uh, just to give you an example here, and, and this is a very, is a highly relevant one for medicine. Uh, the Chinese company Alibaba has been uh, uh, leading when it comes to developing machine learning algorithms for classification, because China has a, a lower percentage of medical doctors uh, compared to the population. And a pathologist, when a pathologist goes through a scan of tumors, it can take one to two days to do the job properly. So whereas if you could use a, a machine, learning machine learning algorithm to go through the more obvious cases, then you can focus on, the, on those which are not properly classified. And then that's where the pathologist would come in then and say that, okay, uh, we have to look a little bit deeper into these images because we are not able to say whether it's a benign or malignant tumor. So that would be another example. There are, there are so many cases that the, the uh, uh, if you go back to, uh, to physics, I mean, you have all the classification of experimental events. Uh, you want to automatize like this search for the optimal material for making quantum for qubits. This is also done in material science and in chemistry. Uh, people which are dealing with, uh, uh, this is another hot topic in, uh, in quantum chemistry, but in general, it's uh, in, uh, uh, within the field of molecular dynamics. And it has applications into material science, into medicine. So when you're making new, new uh, when you're into the field of pharmacy, uh, you would clearly like to model some of these uh, complicated molecules. Now, one of the things which you have problems then when you run a molecular dynamics calculations where you freeze out the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom is actually to design the effective potentials between different atoms and molecules. And there people have used machine learning to find the optimal using experimental data to find and fine tune uh, the uh, classical potentials in a molecular dynamics calculation. So molecular dynamics is you freezing out all the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom. And then you have uh, atoms and molecules which interact with a, a classical potential. And then you solve uh, Newtonian-like equations. But you need a model for the potentials. And people have been using machine learning a lot in that field. And you have applications into pharmacy, making new medicines. You have applications into life science if you want to study DNA or RNA or if you want to develop new materials. So the people doing quantum chemistry uh, have uh, invested a lot of efforts in making, uh, making these effective potentials using machine learning. So I would say that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty hot field. There's actually a Springer lecture notes in physics, which is called quantum, uh, no, machine learning meets quantum mechanics. It's a recent lecture notes in physics by many of the people who do, are practitioners of molecular dynamics. So the, the, uh, I think the, uh, if, I'm, if I'm honest, I wish I was 30 years younger. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> because there's so many exciting things going on. Yeah, no, the thing, yeah. Yeah. no, no, please, please, Martin. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Yeah. The thing which I also like is that the community is very much driven by people who share the philosophy of open source. And um, maybe Martin, since I, I know that uh, you have another commitment on five, these last comments uh, that um, address the, 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 the question that we still have uh, open in the, in the Q&A, uh, this yeah. is probably the right point to um, to conclude the, the colloquium and, uh, and to thank you very much for a fantastic uh, introduction and, um, and also for, uh, for promoting open source <laughs> and, and open science, which is uh, very close to, to our yeah. hearts uh, yeah. as well. And um, also thank you for sharing all the, all the links so that uh, people yeah. 
uh, want to dig a little bit deeper yep. into the subject, have the opportunity. <clears throat> and of course, uh, I guess some of the students of the summer school were also present in, in the talk. They will have the opportunity to, to engage with you again for two weeks, starting from, uh, uh, from the coming Monday. Yeah, right. Important. Thank you very so, much. And, so so I, I, yeah. I just like to say it's been, a, it's been a huge pleasure. The only pity I can't meet you guys in person because that's the, yeah. Uh, I, I, I would know. love, <laughs> but we are hopeful <laughs> that we will get uh, the proper vaccine just yeah, now, yeah, so that yeah. if not this year, next year, yeah. you will be able to come uh, and, and visit us, and uh, and it will be a pleasure to to have you in uh, in, in South Africa. So, Morten, thank you very much. I I will see you latest on Monday morning. <laughs> see you guys. Thanks, thanks for coming. Thanks, we'll, thanks we'll to everyone. Catch. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much to all the participants and have a good evening and uh, keep staying safe because our vaccine is not yet here. <clears throat> yeah. All the best.